Acoustics. Welcome back, Florida Linguistics Podcast listeners. This is a podcast for Thursday, April 22nd, 2010. I'm Lee Ballard, grad student grad student in linguistics at the University of Florida, and I'm here today with Dr. Raymond Shobas. Dr. Raymond Shobas is the conductor of the University of Florida Symphony Orchestra, and we're here today to talk about music and language. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast today. Thank you, Lee. So one common thing that is often said about music is that music is a universal language. Would you agree with this statement? Mm, not really. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we have music um, that needs to be learned. Um, if we think about folk music, yes, people will react to that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I'm not, not a neurologist <laughs> to tell you what makes you jump to music and move to music and make you happy and put you in a good mood. Right. Um, but when I think about the music that I'm conducting with a big orchestra, which is very, very complex, um, that is not, um, I would say, uh, uh, looking for the right word, common to every culture. Okay. Uh, it, it, it is a learned thing, and it, it, it went through an evolution, mm -hmm. that type of language, or it wouldn't have had to be written down, and that process has been going on for more than a thousand years now, mm -hmm. that we're trying to fix notation. Sure. So you think that there is, um, there is some element of music that is kind of elemental, where you've got this physical reaction to music, but there's also the cultural aspect, which um, would depend on where you're growing up and what music you're, you're hearing. So in the tradition that we call uh, classical music, you consider that a very specific tradition that would not be uh, universal? I wouldn't say it is universal, no, but it, it, it maybe in its core it would be, but mm -hmm. it would probably, uh, uh, it would take effort. And it's interesting that very evolved societies, like our Asian societies, yes. are picking up our language and better than we do now. Right. Uh, that is very interesting. As you can see, we have an awful lot of Oriental in our orchestra. And if you look at youth orchestras, you will see that half of them are Oriental, if not more. Mm -hmm. So uh, highly evolved societies, and then somebody can question me again, what is that? Right. I'm, I'm not a sociologist, but uh, there are some cultures, and they're usually very, very... Uh, distinguished culture with a distinguished uh, history right. and written history mm -hmm. that will pick this up and uh, so in that sense it is universal that one has a chance to, to grow into it but I wouldn't think it's there by nature mm -hmm. uh, we see this uh, in our American society where uh, we are actually going backwards again we are mm -hmm. not able to comprehend an intelligent piece of music. Mm -hmm. So uh, unless we, we it's it's learned to us and taught to us in in, in school, and we have well, what we what we would call music education today has nothing to do with really learning anything about music, huh. except to uh, react to it. Okay, because in language, uh, a language is going to be acquired; it's going to be learned naturally by children without having to put forth a whole lot of effort. But I think I would probably agree with you that, yes, in order to learn a style of music, you have to put forth some effort. Um, yeah, but you still have to learn how to write. Yes. So if you want to write a great novel or a great book, or you want to express something very deep and more complex, uh, that will take effort, too. Oh, good point. Yeah. So um, the classical music style um, would be analogous not really to what we're doing right now, which is just using using language to come up with things to say on the spur of the moment, you think that would be more analogous to writing a novel or writing some great work of literature? Yes, a great work of literature, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And how do you go about um, teaching this music to, to younger generations? Well, you don't teach them that music. You, you, I think you open ears like you would open eyes uh, for people to appreciate great art. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you, sh you need to be able to 
to make them aware of 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 the effort that I went back into it. I mean, great things do take effort. Yes, they simply do. Right. I mean, nobody will get uh, around that. You you need to show them. You need to teach them craftsmanship. And uh, and uh, you, you will have to uh, make them aware of the process that uh, processes that are going on. If they don't understand these processes, they don't have the ears to listen to it. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the processes then to people who may not be familiar with the tradition? Well, um, you start with simple melodies. You, you need to kind of come to a point where you can make a, a judgment if some, a melody is good or bad. Mm -hmm. One is banal, one is very predictable, another one is more exciting, more interesting. And why? Right. The same thing with harmony. There are harmonies that are, uh, you know, trodden patterns. You hear 24 hours a day the same pattern over and over again. And then you have more interesting mm -hmm. uh, progressions. Um, that is something uh, one can, uh, can get tuned into. Yes. And we have the same thing. Um, with counterpoint, where there's more than one melody happening at one time, and uh, with that you have to understand, you know, the rules, what makes a good harmony, and how do two melodies, three melodies, four independent melodies, up to six or eight, or how many, sure. work together? How are they individually good, and how do they, uh, so to speak, socially work together? In, in other words. Uh, fulfill certain harmonic expectations. There's a kind of a, a give and take between freedom and restriction, between consonance and dissonance. Somehow this needs to be ruled by any great society. Right. You know? And Order and freedom. Yeah, yeah you that's something that you, you will have to teach uh, uh, children. I, I think you would have to teach them if that can be taught, at least you can prepare them to make judgments of, in, in the end, what is good and what is bad, what is uh, art and what is just simple mm -hmm. banality. Right. And the way you make those judgments is by exposing yourself to a lot of different pieces, a lot of different composers and styles. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, I mean, that's an endless process. Mm -hmm. Right, we have access to so many styles today and to so much music. Um, there are people who specialize in medieval music today, and they're finding out more and more new things by doing it, not by talking about it. Right, by doing it, by recording them, by doing enormous research and trial and error. So it's kind of exciting that process. But if you never, never learn that, uh, you know people will tend to read trash, mm -hmm. listen to trash, eat trash, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not realizing how exploited they are in the end. I think in an educational institution you want to to um, bring people up to a level where they think for themselves Great. and make good judgments. Mm -hmm. How do you think the classical music tradition, as is understood by the uh, outside world or by the culture in general. How do you think that tradition has developed in recent years? Some people might not be familiar with all the different periods that have been um, talked about by music historians, but classical music actually comprises of a few different styles from from the medieval to the Renaissance music to um, early Baroque, late Baroque, classical music, romantic music, and then what kind of was vaguely known as 20th century music or contemporary music. How do you think that these styles um, have ended up in the music that people are writing today? Well, um, this is a process that you can usually not predict. Um, there are certain schools, there are certain styles that were superimposed, so to speak, on a collective society, collectively. And the more we came into the Romantic era, the more we, we kind of emphasized the individual. Mm 
and that's when things started to branch off. You didn't have so many schools anymore than you had a lot of individuals. You, you listen to uh, Stravinsky, you can hear it within a few seconds. This is Stravinsky and it's not Bartok. Yes. Um, with Haydn and Mozart, it's a little more complicated. Of course, professional musicians will tell you immediately, no, this cannot be Haydn, this must be Mozart and vice versa. Yes. Because you understand Mozart's language yeah. uh, through experience. But um, I think today uh, composers don't group themselves together into, into schools. They are really, truly individual um, searches into their own truth. And, and that's why you get this diversity. And when you mentioned, you know, all these different stuff in the Middle Ages, there's one thing I need to, to mention here. You need to be able to hear this music every single time with different ears. You mm -hmm. can, in other words, you cannot listen with the same ears. Yes. You're listening to a Mozart symphony mm -hmm. to listen to a Palestrina mass. Because if you judge, for, in, for example, the harmonic... Uh, richness in a, in, in a Mozart who is highly chromatic, or it can be very highly chromatic, you get such more of a, of a possibilities of different chords. Yeah, as far as I'm in here, so get, pa Palestrina you know? being an Italian composer, right, from, from, the, from the Renaissance period, who composed a lot of very richly textured vocal music for many, many parts when we're talking about this counterpoint. Right, he was it is our counter counterpoint, and the harmony somehow uh, is very. If you compare this to a motor, very limited. So, in other words, you, you hear only very few chords in either what we would call today right. root position or first inversion. Mm -hmm. Very rarely you will will you hear a second inversion because that implies already a dissonance that yes. needs to be resolved. Absolutely. Now, if you listen with to this music with the years, you would listen to a Mozart or Beethoven. You will not have that rhythmical variety. In that sense, you will have not that richness in harmony. It's because you're listening with the wrong ears. Mm -hmm. Because if you try to follow every single line individually, you will be so preoccupied doing this and listening truly to that music that you would not be aware of the limitedness, in a sense, of, of the harmony. But the music suddenly becomes exciting in a different way. Yeah. But if you judge it by, by, by let's say, romantic, by the richness uh, of, of, of our romantic composers, then you will be disappointed. But that's because you are listening to the with to it with the with the wrong ears. Mm -hmm. So would it be fair to say that these different styles of music from the different eras of the European American musical tradition would it be fair to say that these are different stages in the evolution of a language, or maybe even that they're separate languages? Like if you were to say, take the English of today of twenty ten and compare it to Shakespeare's English or to Chaucer's English. What are the English and Beowulf? Technically, they're all called English. They're called Old English and Middle English and Early Modern English and, um, and Contemporary English. They're not really readable by people of the different eras. So if I were to try and read Chaucer, I would not really be able to understand it. And if Chaucer heard Shakespeare, he probably would not be able to understand it. Is, does this same thing apply to, to these musics then, to the Renaissance music and Romantic music? Yes and no because we have a chance today to translate Old English and Modern English. And we will translate an Old English Bible into a Modern English Bible, mm -hmm. uh, a modern, using modern terms for it. We don't do this in music. We, there were attempts, of course, uh, of trying to rescue some of the Renaissance music uh, about a hundred years ago, where Spiegel, uh would, would take those ancient airs and dances and reorchestrate them because he kind of wanted to bring this beautiful music back to an audience who at that time uh, research in, in, in Renaissance music and it did practically not exist. Yeah. So it's, it's speaking, books. your speaking is an, is an Italian composer from, it's an the, Italian composer. from the 20th century. Uh, but today, you see, uh, we won't we, we, we look at suspicion at, at these, uh, these things. We say, no, we should rather do the original rather than 
uh, arrangements right. of those things. But you know, you have to understand the time. Now, now we did more research again, and, and now we can hear the original uh, more easily than we did a hundred years ago. But uh, it was a noble kind of uh, an idea to to keep this music alive and reintroduce it to to an audience, and they did it with orchestra. Uh -huh. You know, but talking about music in general, you know, this is this was just one possibility. Uh, what happened here in in the monasteries in Europe uh, with the notation of the of the Gregorian chant? There is other music in the world that I would I'm not hearing with the right ears because it probably would take me twenty years mm -hmm. to develop that ear and develop in a certain sense that that perfect pitch to understand a gamelan music. Right. So. I, it's it, I'm, I'm not saying which could be I could be misconstrued that there's only one type of music. I right. don't want to be uh, I want to be clear about this. Okay. Um, but since I'm uh, was born into this society and into this race, so to speak, and I had this inclination towards classical music since I was practically born, there's something to it. This is my specialty. I'm not saying this is the only music. There's other music that uh, would take a, an, an enormous. You would you would have to live with the culture yes, to right. understand it and with it, with its language. Sure. And understand the inflection. I've been told that in some languages you can say the same word in twenty different inflections, and each time it has another meaning. Mm -hmm. I I would not know that. Yeah. But I believe that. Probably what you're yeah. thinking, probably what you've heard maybe is that some languages, especially African languages and East Asian languages, have what's called lexical tone. That means that the syllable or the or the sounds of the of the word that we that for us are the basic unit of meaning, those always include some type of pitch element, which for us pitch is used mm -hmm. in the sentence to make a melody for the sentence or to make mm -hmm. some type of intonation pattern for a sentence. But in these languages, the intonation patterns are a little bit more localized and they're used to determine the meanings of the words, which for us sounds a little bit strange um, because it sounds like they're using different inflections on the same word, but for them they're really just considered different words. That could be what you're thinking of, which is very yeah, common. that's why I said you almost think you have this kind of certain perfect pitch for that particular culture or that little yeah. uh, society to understand these inflections better. Right. I think this is something I've also experienced firsthand this week because there was an ensemble in residence uh, here at the University of Florida for Arabic music. And they were called the Arabesque Music Ensemble. And I actually had a violin lesson with their violinist, Hana Khouri from, um, from Israel. And he is schooled in the Western tradition, but also in the Arabic music tradition. And when we were having the lesson, I instantly recognized that these musical elements of pitch and rhythm that are in his blood, that are in his, in his consciousness, deep within the way he plays his instrument when he's playing in the Arabic style, um, something like bayati or samai, which for me, I only learned about them five weeks ago, he was saying, when you phrase this, you need to feel the dum and the tak, because there's a clear structure of, of, the, of the rhythm, the dum and the tak of the samai, for instance, and the clear structure of the microtones, which for me is a foreign language, something that I'm just trying to you know, scratch the surface of, because it goes so deep into what music means for, for that culture. But in order to actually perform this music, he was asking me to perform it on a higher level than I had been able to before. And in order to do that, I really had to get into... Um, the music theory of that of that tradition and into what music is for them, the microtonal system is is a is a wonderful system. But it's something that, with my perfect pitch, I cannot understand the microtone system even. I'm still working on it. I can't just Im immediately transition. And same with the tone languages that we're talking about. Uh, I, I think I would agree with you uh, from the point of view of a linguist even that. Uh, these are things that you have to work hard at if you're not brought up with them. Right. In other words, what's really important is what's happening between the pitches and not the rough pitches that we have in our mm -hmm. well-tempered uh, tuning, which uh, kind of reduced the world of sound into 12 equal half tones, so to speak. Yeah. 
but in that culture, there's so much more in between. Yeah. So you know, we we, we have we, we are so concentrating on on perfect intonation, whatever that means, yes. which it isn't anyway. Right. Right. And in other culture, it's really so much more important what's be what's happening between the pitches. Mm-hmm. You know. Right. So. And which for us, they sound like they're between the pitches. And mm-hmm. for them, I really do believe that they are separate pitches. That is what's mm-hmm. so fascinating mm-hmm. with it. Um, yeah. So one thing I was wondering about, we just played a concert in the Philips Center with the orchestra, and we played music by Vila Vartok from Hungary. We played music by Christopher Rouse, who is an American composer who's still alive. And we played music by Wilhard Strauss, who was a German uh, composer of tone poems and operas. So do you think that, for instance, in the Bartok, that the Hungarian language he spoke had any effect on his music, the rhythms of the Hungarian language, maybe the the sound structure or something about the way the language is structured. Do you think that had anything to do with? The I'm way sure it did. Yeah. Well, he was Hungarian and he was uh, very, very drawn to all the Slav- Slavic languages and and did just that his whole life. Right. More that than composing was to go and collect folk songs and record them among the peasants all over Transylvania and trying to transcribe it into modern notation. Uh, Of course he was he he was drawn to that and there's no accident that he was born where he was born to be attracted to that in the first place. Right. But when he was uh, uh, writing the concerto for orchestra he had no composition position in the United States. He was employed at Columbia University do nothing but transcribe these phonographs mm-hmm. from you know from Transylvania and, and Romania, Bulgaria and all these uh, areas, Hungary and all these areas, Ukraine, in the Balkan. That's that's what he was doing, and I'm sure that uh, this is all to do with with the language. Okay, sure. Yeah, because. <laughs> uh, you can see it in his music, his fascination with odd meters all the time. Right. Um, so some of these, instead of just having four beats in a measure, where each beat is composed of just two eighth notes, you might have three beats in a measure, and the first beat might have three eighth notes in it, and the second beat might have two, and the third beat might also have three again. So you would get um, you would get eight, but instead of being eight evenly distributed um, sub pulses, you would have Three sub pulses, mm-hmm. uh, th- three main pulses, and then each one of them has a different number of sub pulses. Yeah, you can have three three two, or two three three, or three two three, and uh, that's what he does. He, he yeah. juggles it around. So eight is not just two times four anymore. It's, no. it's three plus three right. plus two. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Awesome. And what about a piece like the Rouse, which is um, a piece composed in I think nineteen ninety three. For trombone and orchestra has a lot to do with the memory of Benjamin Britten. I mean, sorry, of uh, Leonard Bernstein, who, whose music is quoted in the, in the final movement of the, of the trombone concerto. Is does the English language have anything to do with the way this piece was composed? I no, I don't think so. No. You think that's just using rhythmic structures from, and and and. Uh, yeah, it would. Structures? It would be hard to to see how uh, Christopher Rouse would have been able to write this piece if he didn't have piece, uh, people like Stravinsky a mm-hmm. hundred years ago, or Bartok, to, uh, to be the first ones to really go off the, the beaten track of, of regular meters. Right. These irregular meters um, were started a uh, hundred years ago on, on, on a more regular basis, the Russians, interesting enough, always liked meters and five. Mm-hmm. Tchaikovsky already did it, of all people where you really don't expect it. Yeah. Borodin did it. So it has somehow uh, an Oriental influence, I would say. Mm-hmm. They were very much into Orientalism at the time. Yeah, Russia and is a, kind uh, of an anomaly because if you ask yourself, well, is Russia part of Europe? Is it is it part of Asia? No one knows. Right. And the, the Russians, I think, have kind of um, agreed that, well, they're sort of both, they're just in Russia. <laughs> they're just their own thing. Kind of in between. Yeah. Yeah. The same might be true with a country like Turkey, 
where are we in, are we part of Asia, or Middle East area, or are we part of Europe? Well, kind of both. Yeah. Countries like that, I think, sit on the fence and have their own very unique contribution to give to right. to the world. Uh, maybe I can ask you one final question about um, about your background, because you are from Switzerland, and Switzerland is a multilingual country with four with four languages. It has German, French, Italian, and then... Uh, well, the German, um, we do read in German. Our newspapers are written in German, but we speak Swiss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Swiss Whoa. is different enough that even the Germans will have a hard time to understand. And in Switzerland, practically every village has already its own inflection. Mm -hmm. We in Basel are a low Alemannic tribe, and our language is totally different from the rest of, of so-called German-speaking Switzerland very different from Zurich. Bern, again, is very different from Zurich and from Basel. They, it has a total different soul to it. Uh -huh. The Bernese people speak very slowly. They draw everything out. Zurich is different when you go to St. Gallen. Further east, they speak already a total different language. You, you go out of Basel 10 miles and they will already use different words. Why do you, you think know, that is? Is it because of the history of the country? I, uh, I don't know. Maybe it was always like that all through Germany. I think it was uh, Luther who kind of uh, invented this high German language, which in a sense is an artificial language to unite people to read the Bible in the vernacular. Otherwise, he would have had to write uh, 10,000 different uh, uh, translation, sure. for, uh, one for every village. Mm -hmm. uh, he kind of, uh, I think, as I'm not an expert in it, but I think he's the one who kind of uh, unified the German. But if you go to Germany and you listen to people in Cologne yeah. and compare that German to Bavaria, to Munich, or Hamburg in the north, you will have very, very distinct different languages and inflections on the language. Yeah. You go to southern uh, Germany, like Freiburg, and they will be much closer again to the Swiss dialect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I lived yeah. in two German cities. I lived in Würzburg, which is part of the state of Bavaria, but is culturally in an area called Franconia. And then I lived in Rennigerode, which is in the former east part of Germany. Um, and I definitely heard a difference in the way people mm -hmm. talked in their everyday lives. A very mm -hmm. big difference. So come back to Switzerland, we, we do speak a Swiss-German language, which is as I said, different enough, and then comes a tradition with it that we, for instance, have a habit in Basel never to exp name a subject by its real name, but we will describe it, uh -huh. you know, and so that that already will throw anybody from Germany off because you, you just don't know what they're talking about. Could you give us an example yeah. of that? Well, just a, a, a very simple uh, example would be instead of calling a house a house, we would call it a hat. <laughs> H-U-T. Okay. Or a box. What would that, what would that sound a, like in, in Swiss? Then? A hütte. Yeah. Instead of a house, we can say hoose. Or we would not call something a, a, a car, an automobile. We would call it a, a, a conserve uh, can or something <laughs> that. Just something, yeah. it, it, it's, it's very different, and, and that's why in Basel we're very different from Zurich. Basel has a very strange sense of humor that in Zurich they don't understand. Mm -hmm. If you say to somebody in Basel, you're an idiot, he's delighted because it <laughs> opens the door for insulting you back, right. and all in good humor. If you do that somebody to, in Zurich, they will not talk to you the rest of your life. It is such a different culture. Wow. And... Um, and then we have French, you know, and then we have Italian, and then we have Romanche. And then today everybody speaks English, so we have five languages. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, my friend was giving a presentation on Asian writing systems, and I was there listening to him. And he was talking about Japanese, which is a complicated writing system because you have to know um, two kinds of kana, which is for writing phonetically in Japanese, and then you have to know kanji, 
which are Japanese characters. So uh, those are Chinese characters. So traditionally there have been three writing systems in Japan, katakana, hiragana, and kanji. But he said, now there's a fourth writing system, which are Roman letters. Because if you don't know Roman letters, you're not going to be able to get around in Japan either. So you have to now know four. Wow. Now you know how the Romance language came all about. Well, all I know is that it's a Romance language. It is. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's spoken around a, a very remote part of Switzerland, between Switzerland and Austria in the east mm -hmm. and south towards Italy. And they were the last ones to be conquered by the Romans. They resisted the Romans for the longest time. Once they were conquered, they kept the language. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a very a very old, almost Latin type of language. Yes. Very close to Romanian, I was told. Mm -hmm. Very strange. Right. But uh, that's how it's... And it's still spoken around St. Moritz in okay. the Grisons. Yeah, my grandfather was from there, so he spoke it. Really? Yeah. Wow. And you will still hear uh, very specific programs on Swiss radio in that language, just to keep it alive before it dies off. Right. Yeah, yeah that's great. We yeah. have a, another podcast about um, language endangerment, music endangerment. I just did a, an interview with Hisham Shami, who plays in this Arabic music group that we were talking about. And he was talking mm -hmm. about you know, keeping the music tradition alive so that it doesn't die, because mm -hmm. they've already had you know, hundreds of years of developing it, and if it were to just die, you would lose something that was awesome. And that's true also with languages to a much greater extent, yeah. I would say. Well, there's a great richness out out there, and today, where everything kind of uh, needs to go mainstream, it's very easy to lose that. And I think classical music is in the in, in the same kind of boat. Mm -hmm. If if we don't keep this refinement up of tuning our ears, uh, I think we're only gonna you know be stuck with Britney Spears and all this and rap music. Mm -hmm. uh, where they are too, there's always good and bad. Yeah. But the good uh, <laughs> is usually always in a very, very big minority. Yeah. Oh, I also want to ask you, um, there is now a Western-style symphony orchestra in the country of Qatar, which is a, a peninsula in the Persian Gulf, very close to the United Arab Emirates. So they don't really have a connection to Europe, but they've just decided, well, I think that we're going to have an orchestra, and now they're hiring um, Western musicians to come play um, ADP's orchestra in Qatar. Have you heard about this orchestra? No, but I hear about their soccer teams that they are putting together. I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, paying an awful lot of money yeah. to. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I don't know why they would do that, but mm -hmm. maybe it's not different from the Japanese and the Chinese now who also pick up uh, this tradition, orchestral tradition. We are losing it here, they are building it. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting process. Yeah, one of the things that I found on YouTube was a video by I Isaac Stern who went to China once um, about 20 years ago and then once maybe 10 years ago and it's called From Mao to Mozart and he went to the conservatory there uh, and gave them master classes. And one of his complaints, he really, really brutalized these students when they were playing for him and was telling them that they were not doing a good job because, at least the ones in the master class, they must have been very, very nervous because Isaac Stern's a great artist, or he was when he was alive. But he said that, yes, you're doing a good job of playing your instrument, but it's like you don't know exactly what the music means. You're playing it like some etude that you're practicing in the morning. And the composer has written fortissimo. I guess he would he would also say that you have to, you know, tune your ears. You have to get involved in what the music means and get involved emotionally into what is going on on stage. Well, what makes a, distinguishes a great performance of of a piece that has been played hundreds and thousands of times by different people is that what makes a good performance is that a great artist will be first of all bring a lot of his own individuality into it. Because the, the symbols on paper, the notes are dead symbols. That's not the music. It's what you breathe into it. Mm -hmm. And it depends how deep you go. A great artist will bring stuff out that you can say, I've heard this a hundred times, 
but I've never heard it like this. It mm -hmm. was like a new experience. Mm -hmm. And I've been told this too, in general, from people who were in competitions, uh, judges in competitions in Asia, that uh, they just got an assembly line kind of carbon copy production of every piece sounded the same. Mm. But that comes with the culture, I think. You know, um, the Asian people uh, are, are, are a very different culture. They behave and think differently, and, and maybe in their culture it's not uh, a virtue to to really bring out your individuality. I, I don't know. Yeah, That's one thing. And secondly, yes, how you would you understand, the, for instance, the humor in a piece. I, I've, I had this experience with a piano sonata. I was taking it apart with my uh, theory class here. And if we really understood sometimes music in, in concert, we, we would be laughing out loud. Mm -hmm. We would probably slap our knees because <laughs> there can be so much humor in it. But if you don't understand that humor, if you don't get the joke, so to speak, uh, then... Well, then you miss a great part of the music, and we listened to a lot uh, of different interpretations about that particular piece, yeah. and we could tell immediately who got the joke, who did not get the joke, and we had some very, very famous recording of this famous Japanese woman pianist, I'm not going to say the name, she totally missed the joke, but she's hailed up as this who knows what... Uh, you know, great uh, interpreter and spiritual, but didn't get, in that particular instance, yeah. didn't get the joke. Whose joke was it? What, what piece? It was a piano sonata by, by Mozart where he really adds a couple of measures that shouldn't be there, and it's really funny, and an interpreter needs to feel that and play it as kind of a funny addition. Yeah. And some just add it like mechanically and you can tell they didn't get the joke. Yeah. There's something like that also in the third violin concerto in G major by Mozart. Uh, the last movement, which keeps switching tempos, um, there's a few extra measures there too. Mm -hmm. And I remember it being very funny. Uh, Mozart and Haydn both wrote pieces. To take an extreme example, they both wrote pieces called like the joke. Right? I know that Haydn has a quartet which is called The Joke. I mean, maybe he didn't put that title there. Someone else may have put it there. But Mozart also has a you know, musical joke where the horn player is out of tune a lot, and it's intentionally written that way to make fun of bad musicians. Right. And that's, all, that's an extreme example. There also is more subtle humor. Yeah, but coming back to your first question, is music universal? It's a perfect example. You need to know that language in order to get the joke. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand the rules or the language of that particular music and you don't laugh to it, you didn't understand it. So therefore, music is not universal. Right. Is there? No. Uh, no. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it is either, but I, 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 yeah. I never thought yeah, it was, well. but that's what a lot of people, I think, would... would grow, they grew up hearing that music is a universal language. I don't, I don't think it is either. Uh, oh, okay. maybe it's basic. Is yeah, it's basic. The you know the our our nervous system reacts to beat, and uh, but I guess as music rises from the feet up, you know, through your loins, further up to your heart and brain, right? <laughs> there's something <laughs> happening there. Yeah, right, right, sure. So one thing that you often tell the orchestra is that we are actors on stage. Um, actors in plays have words that they say and they have they have places to go on the stage and interacting with the other with the other characters and you told us many times that you know, in order to perform this piece correctly in order to to work well as a unit we have to remember that we are there to act could you maybe talk a little bit more about what that means for an orchestra well we have very many mood changes and sometimes it feels oh, oh uh, we have somebody completely different on stage than somebody else somebody is you can tell is a very fat big person the other one is a very thin and very quiet person you can hear uh, music that would fit more the being of a man mm -hmm. or the music more of a woman don't forget I feel the orchestra grew out of the orchestra pit in the opera. Mm. 
-hmm. When you look at the orchestra's function around 1600, its function was to accompany opera singers. And only 120 years later, the orchestra became kind of something on its own. Uh, you know, think about Bach suites or so. But the, the very core of the symphony orchestra comes from the opera pit. And I think that's, that makes my, um, and, uh, you know, my, my comparison very valid because you can hear it in a, in a piece of music. You have different people on stage, mm -hmm. sometimes even together. Mm -hmm. You know, look at Mozart operas and, and see what he's doing in his symphonies. Right. It's not much different, except they don't sing in the symphony. But you have the same characters appearing. You can tell there's a drama happening here. You can see almost visually different characters interacting with one another. And that's what I mean. If the music is sad and we are not sad, nobody's going to believe an actor when he says, I'm sad, and he is, is, is stupidly smiling in, uh, to the audience. It, yeah. You have to be in character. Mm -hmm. Musicians need to be in character. When the music is happy, they need to be happy. Mm -hmm. When it's sad, they need to be sad. I mean, just, you know, to tap into a couple of primitive emotions here, uh, there's so much more in between. In that sense, we need to be good actors, convincing actors. You have to be in the mood of of the moment what the music is all about because if the musicians are not don't expect the audience to be in the, in that in the right mood mm -hmm. they need to understand what kind of a story they are telling if they don't understand it would then what would you believe it if an actor just uh, recites words and you can tell the man has no idea what he's talking about right, no. you know no, you wouldn't it would be convincing would it no no, so we have to be the same way. We need to be convinced uh, of what the story is all about that we are telling and the musicians are the professionals. And if we are not, then the audience will not be. All right. Sometimes the music is good enough, it can stand on its own. And there we have, of course, a conflict. Is, is music abstract? I would go the other way. I, I'm more of the type of musicians say they, there is no such thing as abstract music. They are human beings who had life experiences and that shows in their music, it shows in their paintings by what subjects they choose to paint and they're just exercises. But when it comes to real stuff, there's a lot of a human being in, in every composition. Mahler said, you know, the world is in my symphonies. Mm. This is not abstract music. This is, it's in a sense, program music. Mm. It's, it's, it's connected to you, human experience. And if you start writing like a computer, like in the 1950s, serial music where everything is serialized, well, I think a computer could almost do it better. Yeah. And that did not last very long, did it? Yeah. A it computer was, could uh, probably also perform it better because the performers have to... Really, it's, it's the hardest music to perform, yeah. I could imagine. Yeah, but yeah. then, you know, um, is that the purpose of music? Yeah, there's something communicative, I think, that's lost when you start serializing yeah. things. Unless you have a master, like Pierre Boulez. Mm. When he did his own music, it always made sense. But then either, either he is light years ahead of society, of the collective, you know, or <laughs> we're still trying to get up there, but we have taken a complete new turn now yeah. we're much more uh yeah telling stories again rather than spitting formulas out and the cerebrality i kind of is passe for for the moment yeah but that is not a license to start composing cheap cheaply yeah you know and there's so much cheap stuff going out there people doing everything by year on synthesizers but they have no clue about craftsmanship. You have the same thing in art classes. People don't learn how to draw anymore. To draw a hand, for instance. You know, it's, it's, I don't know if that's the right way to go because that opens the door to a lot of cheapness. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, for the moment, we'll just enjoy, um, you know, playing the orchestra music and coming to concerts and trying to support the tradition as much as we can. So that way, it's a living tradition instead of something that's. It is dead. a communication, and it should be heard in a concert hall, and not just on CD where you're distracted by a million things at home. Mm. eating cookies and doing that and <laughs> doing homework yeah. uh, that is not conscious listening right well thank you very much Dr. You're Shobas very welcome. thank you Lee um, this has been Lee Ballard and Dr. Shobas for floridalinguistics.com please visit the website for an archive of the podcast episodes general information about linguistics and a way to get in touch thanks for listening see you again soon Florida Linguistics